Okay, for uh, <coughs> finite automata, we started with deterministic finite automata and then we defined non-deterministic uh, finite automata and we showed that uh, they are equivalent. But for PDA, we started with the definition where we allowed uh, non-deterministic moves, right? Like uh, this non-deterministic move and also epsilon move, which introduces uh, also non-determinism. So, <coughs> and what is the idea of determinism and non-determinism? As we discussed before, I'm not just for uh, finite automata or uh, uh, push down automata. And for other automatas also, which we haven't discussed yet, this linear bounded automata or Turing machine. So the general idea of non-determinism is that um, there should be some configuration at any point of time. And the next configuration, uh, so for deterministic case, the next configuration will be uniquely determined. Uh, so this is determines, okay. So, <coughs> uh, so that is the idea for uh, yeah. so this is determines. So this is the idea for uh, determinism, <coughs> and why our PDA that we defined uh, so far is not uh, uh, deterministic because of uh, uh, precisely these two cases. So in one case, uh, it's not a epsilon uh, transition. So you are in some state Q, but you have multiple possibilities for the same current input symbol and current uh, stack symbol. So this is the current, the top stack symbol, right? This Z and this is the uh, current uh, input symbol. So the transition looks at these three things, right? This Q, this A and Z. But even with this triplet, you can either move to state P1 and replace this Z by gamma 1 or you can move to P2, replace this Z by gamma 2, okay? So if you look at the transition function, so this delta Q, A, Z, so this contains multiple entries, okay? There are more than one entries. So, so this is the condition which uh, kind of uh, forces this sort of uh, non-determinism. And here this A uh, can either be a uh, symbol or it can be uh, epsilon transition also. So even with this uh, epsilon, you can have uh, this epsilon and Z and you can have uh, multiple uh, transition. So this sort of uh, non-determinism um, is relevant for both uh, a symbol and uh, epsilon transition. But even when, uh, say, uh, this uh, set is singleton, so you only have one possibility for a combination A Z. Okay, so now we move to this uh, case two. So here you see that this is just singleton. But on top of that, if you have a epsilon transition, so even here the epsilon transition, I mean, it, it can be just one, uh, it can be just a singleton set. I mean, it can be more than one, but uh, if you just have one here and if you just have one here, then also you have uh, non-determinism non here, right? Because of the same z. Because what happens here is that here, starting from the state Q, okay, you are in state Q and you actually process this input symbol A and you replace this Z by this gamma 1, right? So this is one possibility and you move to this P1. The other possibility is that you do not process this input symbol at all, okay? So that is why it's a uh, epsilon transition. But you replace this Z by uh, gamma 2 and you move to some state P2. So even when uh, uh, this set is singleton, you can still have uh, uh, non-determinism if you have uh, also a epsilon transition, okay? So these are the uh, uh, two possible cases for having uh, non-determinism. So 
yeah, it's explicitly written here that starting from this configuration, you can move to either this configuration or this configuration where you have processed this part. But this can be epsilon also. In that case, it's just W and W. Uh, <coughs> and in this case, this A is uh, in sigma. Okay, uh, so this A is not epsilon. So in here, this transition is not a epsilon transition. So this transition is this transition. So it is actually processing this symbol A. So the remaining input is just W. And in this case, it's not processing any input symbol. So the remaining input is still AW. And so here also you have multiple possibilities. Now, in order to uh, uh, define uh, a deterministic PDA, we need to ensure that uh, this this principle is uh, satisfied. That the current configuration, and in this case, configuration means the instantaneous description. So these are IDs, right? Instantaneous description. So we need to ensure that uh, if you are given a current ID, then the next ID should be uniquely determined. So the transition function should be such that that this uh, condition is satisfied then we can call that a deterministic pd okay so we will first define deterministic pda uh, and uh, then uh, the obvious question is uh, are these two models uh, equivalent that means they are equal in power so in finite automata we saw that they are uh, equivalent but in here we will see that they are not equivalent okay so you can see that a deterministic pda is just a pda so it is kind of a restricted pda where uh, you cannot have multiple uh, possibilities for next configuration so it's still a pda so by definition uh, a pda is at least as powerful as a deterministic pda but now the question is can we show that uh, the deterministic PDA is as powerful as the PDA? And the answer is no. I'm um, actually we will uh, we won't go into the full proof because it's beyond the chapters uh, we are studying in this course. But uh, at least we will outline uh, why uh, that is true. So let's first define uh, what a deterministic PDA uh, is formally. So again, remember that in a deterministic PDA, we need to avoid these two sort of uh, non-determinism. Okay. So then, so if we need to avoid this case and this case, so first of all, to avoid this case, we need this to be one. Okay. So this cannot be more than one. So in a deterministic PDA. So you have this set of states, input alphabet, stack alphabet, transition function, and this start state, start symbol, and final state. So in here, for any state and any input symbol or this epsilon uh, and any uh, stack symbol Z, so this cannot be more than one. So this can be empty. In that case, there is no move from this uh, combination. So your machine will get stuck and uh, the input will be rejected, but uh, it can't be more than one. Okay. So this is uh, the first condition to block this sort of uh, non-determinism. And then we saw that even if this is one, okay. So then this there should not be any epsilon transition from here, right? Because if this is not empty, so then we have a non-determinism. So the next thing is that, okay, this can't be more than one, but even if this is one, so this is, uh, uh, yeah. So that means, uh, so in, in here, this A can be epsilon, right? Uh, so yeah, here. So here, this A can be epsilon. So that means uh, we we can allow this to be of cardinality one, but then these two should not occur simultaneously, right? So that means if we allow this to be one, so if this is non-empty and this is non-empty means by the first condition, its cardinality can be at most one, 
okay so not in not empty means uh, by the first constraint it can contain just one uh, entry so if that is the case uh, for this q epsilon z so then there cannot be this transition so that means then for any symbol so this is epsilon so then for any symbol here you cannot have any transition so uh, sorry this should be delta uh, this should be delta okay so delta of this thing uh, should be uh, phi okay now if we uh, impose these two constraint on a pda so then the next configuration will be completely uh, determined by the current configuration and the next id should be determined by the current id and then we can call it a deterministic pda and the crucial difference between finite automata and uh, push down or this deterministic finite automata and deterministic push down automata is that here we are allowing epsilon transition so you see that uh, we, we are allowing uh, this transition but uh, if there is a epsilon transition so then we are uh, kind of blocking uh, this transition right by this uh, uh, second constraint so deterministic pds can have epsilon transition right uh, so it, it can contain uh, this singleton thing but then for all uh, symbols uh, in this uh, sigma so you cannot have any other transition for for any other qaz uh, so this should be empty so then the only uh, transition from here is this so you have something and no matter what you have here since this is empty you you won't be able to process this a right so the only transition you can make from here is by not processing anything here and making an epsilon transition so this remains as it is this and this remains as it is but you will change the state to p from q to p and then you will replace this z by gamma so this z is being replaced by gamma so this is the only transition uh, so which still determinism is uh, uh, preserved okay <coughs> so uh, <coughs> now what is the language accepted by uh, deterministic pda so for uh, general pda we showed that uh, uh, so still there are two criteria right uh, acceptance by uh, final state and acceptance by uh, empty stack and uh, for general pda we showed that they are equivalent in the sense that if a language is accepted by some pda by final state then that language is also accepted by some pda by empty stack and vice versa if some language is accepted by some pda by uh, empty stack then there is another pda which accepts the same language uh, by final state and this is uh, true for uh, dpda also right so this l is some language which is accepted by some dpda by final state so this l of m we use for final state if you remember so this is for final state so if this happens then this happens that there exists another dpda so this is a deterministic pda so there is another deterministic pda m prime such that it accepts the same language but not by this uh, final uh, state but by empty stack and this is if and only if condition so vice versa so here again we can say that uh, uh, a language is accepted by some dpda if we say that a language is accepted by some dpda so we do not need to specify uh, whether it is accepted uh, i mean i mean is it possible so i mean <laughs> the, the dpda might change but if we say that the language is accepted by some dpda okay so then we need not uh, specify whether uh, it is accepted by uh empty stack or by uh, final state because if it is accepted by some dpda by empty stack it's equivalent to saying that it is 
uh, accepted by some DPDA by final state and vice versa. So, the class of languages, okay, if we consider all the language uh, that is accepted by uh, DPDS uh, by final state, so that is the same class of language which is accepted by DPDS by empty stack. So, this class of languages which is accepted by DPDS, so we call that deterministic context free language or DCFL, okay. Now, as I mentioned before, this DPDA is just a special case of uh, PDA, right? So, that means the class of languages that is accepted by DPDS, it is by definition a uh, subset of the class of language which is accepted by PDAs and the class of languages which is accepted by PDAs is just CFLs, right? And this we just defined as uh, uh, deterministic uh, CFLs. So, from the definition it immediately follows that this is a subset of uh, this deterministic CFLs uh, are subset of um, is a subset of the uh, class of CFLs. Now, the question is, is this inclusion strict or it is actually equal, right? So, we could have done the same thing for uh, finite automata, we could have said that class of languages accepted by uh, deterministic finite automata and class of languages accepted by non deterministic finite automata and by definition it would mean that uh, the deterministic class is a subset of the non deterministic class, but then we actually showed that it is not just a subset it is actually equal, but in this case. Uh, what about uh, this? Is this inclusion strict or uh, is this equal? So, <coughs> the thing is, uh, it, it is not equal. And the way to prove this is that we have already proved that CFLs, this class of CFLs, uh, is not closed under inversion. Okay. So, that means uh, I mean if you have a CFL L this L bar may not be a CFL and we gave uh, proof for that for the closure property of CFL you go to that video and uh, we proved that the class of CFLs not the CFLs the, the class of CFLs is not closed under inversion ok. And then there is a theorem I mean it is uh, much later in half craft full man I mean it is even after all this steering machine and all. So, if you are uh, interested you can go to those chapters and read it on your own uh, if you are interested to see the proof. Uh, <coughs> and uh, the proof I mean if you remember for finite automata uh, we proved the closure under inversion by just inverting the set of final states. So, I mean in some sense for DCFL uh, the proof is along that same uh, way, but the proof gets complicated because of this epsilon transition, because in, in, in DPDA we are allowing epsilon transition. So, if we are allowing epsilon transition then just, just by inverting the set of final states we cannot uh, get from L to L bar. So, we have to do some more work and uh, that is just some tedious uh, voting part of that proof, but uh, once you uh, prove that you can sort of manage this uh, epsilon transition. So, then it is it is like uh, inverting the set of final states and to go from L to L bar in the same spirit that we did uh, for this uh, deterministic finite automata, but in any case. Uh, you can prove that this DF and DCFLs are closed under in inversion. So, that means if you have a DCFL L, so a deterministic uh, context free language L, so then the complement of uh, L, so that is L bar, will also be a DCFL. So, in general, it will be a CFL, right. So, here it is not guaranteed if you take any arbitrary CFL. Uh, it's in it, it's complement uh, it's complement may not be a CFL, but if you take a DCFL, which is also a CFL, 
and if you take its uh, complement, it is guaranteed to be a DCFL, which is obviously a CFL. So, uh, hmm. so uh, <coughs> you see that uh, these two classes cannot be same, right? So this sh should be a strict uh, subset. Okay. So if if we combine this thing, so the class of CFLs will be a strict super subset of the class of deterministic uh, CFLs and uh, that is why the PDA is strictly more powerful than deterministic PDA. Okay. So, in fact, if you have a CFL, so suppose uh, you have a language and you can write down uh, 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 context-free grammar or you can design a PDA for that L. So, then you know that that is a CFL and then you take the complement of uh, uh, that uh, language. So, you take L bar and if you can prove, so we have discussed uh, this pumping lemma for CFL. So, using all those pumping lemma and all, if you can prove that this L bar is not a CFL, okay. So, then you know that this L cannot be a DCFL because for DCFL its bar should be a CFL. So, this is one way to prove that some language is uh, not a DCFL and um, some CFL is not a DCFL. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, so in fact, that is that's kind of the only tool uh, available. So, you are given a CFL and you prove that its complement is not a CFL. So, then you know that though this L is a CFL, but it cannot be a DCFL. So, this is the only way to uh, kind of distinguish it uh, from the DCFL class. Okay, so just one example of uh, a deterministic context-free language. So, uh, you have a string uh, over this a b. So, this is a non empty string uh, consisting only of uh, the symbols a b. So, then you have a c and then you have a mirror image of this uh, w. So, you remember this reverse, right? So, um, if so, this reverse is just reading this w from the opposite side, right? So, if this w is say 1 1 0 0. So, then the reverse is just uh, 0 0 1 1 this sort of thing. So, ju just the mirror copy of this uh, w. So, that is w r and in the middle you have a c right. Uh, so, if you take this language this is a CFL and why is this a CFL? So, you just work it out uh, I mean it, it is quite simple I and mean the uh, production uh, is uh, so you start from this s. So, this S can go to uh, A, S, A or B, S, V or C. So, this is a grammar for uh, this S. So, this is a CFL uh, uh, you can readily see. But to prove that this is actually a DCFL, you have to construct a deterministic PDA for this language. And uh, this is how you uh, do it. So, you start from this start state and uh, um, the initial stack symbol is just Z0, right? And unless you encounter this C, so as long you are, as long as you are encountering this A or B, so you see that here this loop, this contains all this uh, A and B, so this does not contain C. So, as long as you are reading this w part, so when you are in z0, for the first symbol you just con I mean convert this to, uh, I mean if this is a then you convert this to z a and if this is b then you convert this to z b. So, here you see that you are in z0, so, so that means you are just starting out uh, with this uh, state q0 which is the start state. And if you see a A, then you just uh, replace this by Z A. If you see a B, you replace this by Z B. So, this Z A Z B are single symbols. So, they are not uh, two symbols or anything. So, <coughs> uh, so this this is just to keep track of the fact that uh, you just saw a A or you just saw a B. Okay. Right. Uh, 
and then for the rest of the part if you see a uh, a then you uh, uh, sorry this this part uh, yeah so if you see a a so then you push uh, capital a if you see a b then you push a capital b okay you just push so how do we push uh, so uh, from this uh, q0 if you see uh, a a and say that current top stack symbol is b so you will just push another a so that means this b will be replaced by ab right so you are not removing this b so it is here you are just adding a a on top of it so that means it's just to remember that you saw a uh, a right and if you see a b and uh, suppose the top stack symbol is a so then you just put another b over it okay so this is true for this b also the b is already there and you see a small b and you put another b on top of this and this is same here also so you already have a top uh, stack symbol a and you see another input small a so just to remember this you put another uh, capital a here so you see that after processing this you remember this symbol uh, in here in form of a version of z and the rest of the thing so you saw this a b so you actually pushed this a and b so this gets reversed right uh, and once you see this c okay uh, so you just uh, process this c and then you move to the next uh, state uh, q1 you do not do anything to the stack so if the stock uh, so this this is do nothing to the stack right so if it is a then it remains a if it is b it remains b uh, but it just processes this c so uh, from here it just processes this c and it does nothing to the stack but it changes the state from q0 to q1 and from here so you have already remembered uh, sort of this part the mirror copy of this part the, the this w part uh, here uh, as a stack as a stack string so th this stack string is actually kind of corresponds to now this mm, reverse of w but just in form of this capital b a and this z a or z b right so now the remaining thing is that to match this thing so to match this b with b a with a and this a with z a and uh, this is how you can uh, do that so you just match so if you see a, a and if you uh, have a stack symbol a so you just um, i mean i mean you just remove this a so this epsilon means what you are replacing this capital a by epsilon that means you are just popping this out and you are processing this a so this a is also gone so from here so you'll make this transition right so you process this b and this b will be gone for this so this b will be replaced by this epsilon so you are matching sort of this b with b so this b is gone this capital b is gone uh, and uh, um, similarly um, so this uh, next a uh, is gone uh, and you are matching with this a so this b a is gone this b a is gone so you are left with this a and z a and when you come to this z a you know that this is the last thing so uh, so from here you finally match this thing so this a with z a and b with z b and you move to uh, the state which is the accepting state so both by empty stack and by final state this thing accepts uh, this th this language okay so this is just one example of dcfl so you are if you are asked to show that something is a dcfl you construct a dpda for that if you are asked to show that something is not a dcfl but a cfl so then uh, to show that it's a cfl you construct a cfg or pda for that and to show that it is not a dcfl so then you take its uh, complement and show that uh, it's not a cfl by using pumping lemma for cfl or something like that okay so now we come to uh, other types of grammar so so far uh, we are just uh, talking about 
context uh, free grammar so now we will just briefly uh, uh, i'm discussed uh, two other types of grammars which are i'm um, even more generalizations uh, so context sensitive grammar is a generalization of context free grammar and uh, then we will uh, see this unrestricted grammar which is a generalization of context free grammar so they are more and more uh, uh, general so what is a context sensitive grammar so it's the same uh, thing like we have this uh, non terminals terminals productions and start symbol same as this uh, context free uh, but now the productions if you remember uh, for context free uh, language the productions are of the form so that you are replacing a non terminal with a string which consists of both terminal and non terminal right so these are the form of the productions for context free grammar but for context sensitive grammar the productions will be of this form so even in here you have a string and here also you have a string so it, so it says that you can replace this uh, thing by this thing now if you look closely you see that we are not doing anything to this alpha and beta so we are just replacing this one non terminal so this capital a is just one non terminal this is being replaced by this gamma so now you may say that okay it's same as uh, cfg but there is a difference so you can make this replacement not so if you see this whole thing this alpha a beta so then only you can replace it by alpha gamma beta so that means if you do not have this alpha beta uh, on the left and right of this a so you cannot make this uh, transition right so though you are replacing a single variable a by a string this is different from uh, this context free case so you can make this replacement uh, only when this you have this context so that means this a is sitting between this alpha and beta so only in this context you can make this uh, change you, you cannot uh, uh, i mean make this change for any uh, a you encounter in your sentential form okay you can make uh, yeah in this context so that is why it is context sensitive okay it, it kind of looks around it it it, it sees what is the context of uh, a and uh, yeah in this context it makes this uh, replacement so just to give you an arbitrary example it's not some uh, uh, well defined uh, thing or any nice thing so i have just arbitrarily written down some uh, productions so here again the non terminals are just this s uh, this capital s capital a b c Uh, this sort of thing and the uh, terminals are this small uh, lower case letters this a b uh, c this things so now you see that here the productions again at of this form so i in this case you can say the alpha is uh, this small a capital a and this beta is uh, capital c so this remains unchanged so this small a capital a and this c remains unchanged we are replacing this b by this small b and uh, we can have multiple productions also like we had uh, for uh, context uh, free grammar so for example here this b is being changed by this bb here this b is being changed by bbb but the context is preserved you see that we can make this transition only when we have this b and capital a here or this ba and c here so uh, this sort of thing right uh, so for example we can have this uh, derivation so all this derivation and uh, generation so th these are same as uh, this context free language so here we can make this transition because uh, we are uh, using uh, this rule okay so uh, okay yeah so this b remains as it is so this we are not even looking at this uh, b so just consider this part so this matches with this right side so we can replace this by this thing so we are doing this and this b remains as it is 
like in uh, context free uh, case and then uh, uh, so this a is being uh, uh, replaced by this uh, small a uh, say by this thing so this is a context free sort of production so it doesn't uh, um, so you can have this alpha beta as epsilon also so that is why it's a generalization of context free grammar so you see that by definition it's a generalization of context free grammar because in context free grammar this alpha and beta are always epsilon right now here there are uh, certain things for example you see that uh, in this case this small a abc this part is being converted to uh, so this b is here we are not doing anything to this b so this thing is uh, being converted to this thing right so we are first changing this b and uh, then we are changing this a right and in context free grammar we saw that this order doesn't matter i mean we can apply this production first and that production next uh, or we can switch the order of this uh, production uh, so uh, but in here you see that we cannot do that though i mean this is just replacing b okay uh, so this is just replacing uh, b and this is just uh, replacing this uh, a okay so you see that here we are just replacing this b by small b and here we are just replacing this capital a by small a so it, though it is happening in two different places but we cannot switch the order of this uh, derivation because you see from here to here i mean if we want to uh, so this part is okay we can replace this a by a because of this production so it, this doesn't have any uh, context uh, so we can do this but from here we cannot go to here right because for b the productions are this this and this so if you want to replace b you have to have one of this context and this doesn't uh, have any of this context right so you cannot make uh, this thing so you have to go via uh, this production first and this production then next so this gives you some power over uh, how you order your uh, things and uh, uh, though by definition you see that it is uh, at least as powerful as uh, context free grammar uh, so but uh, it's it's not immediately clear that uh, it is strictly more powerful but it is indeed the case that uh, context free grammars uh, context sensitive grammars are strictly more powerful than context sensitive uh, context uh, free grammars okay uh, because uh, there are uh, languages <coughs> so uh, what is a context sensitive language it's the class of languages uh, uh, generated by this context uh, sensitive grammars okay so if you take the class of cfls so there is a um, sorry the class of csls so uh, there is a context uh, sensitive uh, language uh, so that that is not a context free language so 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 th this is this is immediate so since this this production is a, a generalization of this sort of production so this part is uh, immediate that uh, the class of uh, the CSLs. Uh, so this is a superset of the class of uh, uh, so class of CSL. So this is CFL. This should be CFL. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So this class of CSL is a superset of CFL. So that is immediate. But uh, there exists uh, context sensitive language. Uh, which are not cfl okay uh, so again you can look into the textbook uh, i mean uh, it has lots of uh, productions and some i don't know some more than 10 productions and uh, you need to do a huge uh, induction to show that uh, that language is accepted by those productions and uh, then you have to apply uh, 
context uh, sorry pumping lemma for context free languages to show that that language is not a context free language uh, and after doing all those things um, you will prove that that language is accepted by a uh, context sensitive grammar but not by any context free grammar so this inclusion is actually strict so this uh, this this model of context sensitive grammar is strictly more powerful than uh, context free grammar this model of context free grammar okay and then there is uh, even more powerful even more general form of grammar which is unrestricted grammar okay so in unrestricted grammar uh, so again it is same you have this non terminals this variables terminals production uh, start symbol but now the productions can be anything okay so the productions are of this form so this alpha goes to beta so this is a string this is a string so earlier also we had a string here and we had a string here but the replacement was happening over just one uh, non terminal so here you do not have any any restriction so that is why it's unrestricted so if you have this string you can replace this string by this string so this is as general as it uh, gets and you see that this is a generalization of uh, csg because uh, context sensitive grammar is just a special case of this so again by the definition the class of language is generated by unrestricted grammar so this is a superset of class of csls and uh, which is a strict superset of uh, so it is not equal so this uh, cfls right cfls uh, uh, and this also uh, is actually uh, a strict uh, um, a strict inclusion so again this proof is uh, harder uh, because uh, uh, i mean you have to use something called diagonalization and uh, and then that that is again beyond the scope of uh, this uh, course but uh, at least you should keep track of uh, at least you should uh, keep track of uh, the fact that uh, uh, there exists uh, languages uh, which are uh, accepted by uh, unrestricted grammar but which are uh, not uh, accepted by uh, context uh, sensitive uh, grammar so like just like the relation between uh, context free grammar and context sensitive grammar uh, is the same and there exists a language which is accepted by unrest unrestricted or which is generated by unrestricted grammar but not uh, generated by uh, Uh, context sensitive grammar so that is why this inclusion is actually strict inclusion and this model is strictly more powerful than uh, the model of context sensitive grammars and just to give you a uh, example so this is a much nicer example so the input alphabet is uh, so this terminal is just uh, this a right so it's just uh, strings over the symbol a but the number of a is is just some power of 2 so you have uh, so th this i is greater than 0 so uh, you can have 2 uh, here so you can have uh, a square a to the 4 uh, um, or a to the uh, 8 a to the 16 okay power of 2 here uh, and uh, here is just a set of productions uh <coughs> to show that uh, this language is actually uh, generated by some unrestricted uh, grammar and with this sort of production uh, of of this form okay so here you see that uh, it's not a replacement of one uh, variable okay so it's just uh, replacing some string with another string and uh, just to give you a uh, Uh, idea of what is happening here is that you see that from s you have just one uh, production so you will first generate this thing 
and then <clears throat> at some point of time you will have some power so this a to the power uh, 2 okay uh, so this uh, c is sitting in front and here you have a to the power 2 so here uh, it's just 2 to the power 1 right so a square uh, and here you even have this uh, uh, 2 to the power 0 so it is it's, uh, a to the 1 which is a to the power 2 to the power 0 here it is a to the power 2 to the power 1 and here uh, again I think you will have uh, okay so yeah you will have something like that and <coughs> Once you have this configuration, so it is kind of uh, has these two boundaries which are marked by this capital A and capital B. So this acts as some kind of boundary and then this C kind of moves uh, back and forth. Okay, So um, and when this C moves forward, so from here, so this C kind of moves forwards and forward and reaches this B, so it reaches this end. And when it does that, it jumps over uh, A and then it makes this A as AA. You see that this C jumps over this A so and, and it replaces this A by AA. So it is doubling the number of A. So this is where the doubling happens. So you have this 2A and this C goes to the end and then this AA becomes um, the 4 uh, A's. Right? So you could have uh, done this thing. Uh, one more time and uh, um, again you will uh, you could have go to a uh, sentential form a c uh, 4a and then b and then when this a moves again to this last point this 4a will become 8a but here we are just generating this 4a so we, we just do it uh, two times so the c a becomes a a c so you see that this happens one time and again uh, after some time you go back to this configuration and then it moves here and it just doubles the number of A's okay and when it comes back it comes back as uh, D so it reaches this end and after it reaches this end when it sees this B so that is why this this context uh, is important here so when it sees this B uh, it, it knows that uh, it has reached the rightmost uh, boundary and it converts into D and then this D um, comes back to forward um, so adjacent to this A and it does not change the number of A so you see that it just jumps over this A so this D jumps over this so it is in middle again it jumps back and uh, so it is here so uh, <coughs> so this D does not change uh, this A so it is just the version of C which comes back okay when it goes forward is it is written as c when it comes back it is written as d when it goes forward it doubles the a's so that is how it it, it gets doubled so now once it is uh, here so once you are done with your number of a's okay so now you say that uh, okay i'm done and now i'm going to end this process so this cb you just uh, uh, use uh, this this rule so you convert this to E when you have taken this uh, step that means you are not going to get any more C's so you are now going to end this thing you have to get rid of this uh, uh, non-terminal so you um, convert this to E then this E comes back to the front because of uh, this thing you see that this E jumps to the uh, left of a it does not change this a so this a just slowly jumps left 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 and uh, so it, so it slowly comes to this front and once you have this a it, it knows that okay I am about to end this thing and I have reached the front boundary so this a kind of annihilates into nothing so you just are left with this a so this is how it generates this thing so this is just one unrestricted grammar to show that uh, you can generate this thing using unrestricted grammar but this is not the language which distinguishes it from the uh, CSLs because you can also show that uh, 
you can write a context sensitive grammar for this thing but the number the, the, the productions will be much more horrible and this is the example that is given in half draft will man so so this 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 production is also given there so they have given a uh, unrestricted uh, grammar uh, for this language and they have also given a the a context sensitive grammar for this language so this is both uh, csl and uh, unrestricted grammar generated uh, language but it is much easier to uh, uh, see uh, in in this form so if you are interested you can look at the context sensitive grammar for the same language uh, but uh, that will be hard to follow and uh, but though this language doesn't distinguish uh, the class of unrestricted grammar and uh, context sensitive grammar there are languages for which you can show that uh, uh, in fact that proof is not even constructive it's a existential proof you use this tool of diagonalization to prove that there exists some language you do not construct that language so you just show that there exists some language which will be accepted by unrestricted grammar but which is not accepted by uh, context sensitive language so uh, this is uh, just uh, a hierarchy of uh, grammars So the hierarchy looks like this. So you have uh, CFL, which is uh, correspond, which corresponds to uh, CFG, and you have a subclass of deterministic uh, CFLs. Uh, so we haven't uh, given a grammatical representation for this, but uh, this CFG is equivalent to PDA, and then we have a deterministic PDA here. and the generalization of this cfl the first generalization is uh, context sensitive language which again is determined uh, by this context sensitive grammar so here we have a grammar here we, here we have a grammar and again we have further generalization where we have unrestricted grammar uh, and this set of languages are called ari languages and then there are non ari languages for this part uh, i mean there is no grammar at all okay but even if you look inside so you we, you know that uh, this uh, pdas are generalization of uh, uh, finite automata right so in that sense this class of regular language uh, so this is a subset of uh, the class of cfls or if dcfls and uh, we proved that uh, this is actually a strict inclusion right now we give lots of characterization for uh, regular languages so through dfa through nfa through uh, <coughs> regular expression uh, so we will introduce uh, another uh, way to uh, characterize regular language which is regular grammar uh, which will be a restricted form of uh, context free grammar so in that sense we will have a hierarchy uh, purely based on grammars so regular languages will be uh, languages accepted by regular grammar uh, cfls are uh, languages accepted by cfg csls uh, csg and so on so let's just uh, quickly go through that regular grammar uh, <coughs> so you just notice uh, that uh, suppose you have uh, a nfa uh, like this uh, so this is uh, without epsilon transition say now you consider a corresponding uh, context free grammar g where uh, <coughs> the non terminals are states in m okay the terminals are uh, same as the input alphabet here because uh, this is what defines the language then we have some instructions and uh, the start symbol here is q0 okay because uh, the non terminals are precisely this uh, set of uh, states so uh, <coughs> this is part of this non terminal so this can be a start symbol 
and uh, how do we uh, <coughs> construct this set of production so we put productions of this form so now see that this q and p so these are uh, states in our nfa right and uh, <coughs> so this is a non terminal in our uh, cfg which is being replaced by a combination of uh, this uh, one terminal before this so this a is uh, part of this sigma and then p is again uh, part of this q which is a non terminal here and we put this in our production if we have this transition in this nfa so that means uh, with current state a and current input symbol uh, sorry with current state q and uh, with current in input symbol a so this nfa makes a transition to uh, state p okay since this is a nfa uh, we cannot put equal to so we are just uh, saying that this belongs to one of the uh, possibilities <coughs> and how do we uh, capture this f so this is uh, i mean what we include to kind of uh, capture this f into this uh, grammar also so we put uh, this uh, <coughs> productions this epsilon production so this q going to this empty string uh, if this q belongs to this uh, set of final state here okay so this is how we construct this grammar and now the claim is that the language accepted by this grammar by final state uh, uh, so not final state sorry this is not a pda so the language uh, sorry, generated by this uh, cfgg which is l of g is uh, same as the language uh, accepted by this nfa and through this set of final state so this is the claim and this shows that uh, you can accept any regular language through a grammar which where, where the productions are of this form okay so either uh, a terminal goes to epsilon or uh, a terminal goes to this combination of two symbols where the first symbol is a terminal the second symbol is a non terminal okay and uh, why is this true because of the simple reason you see that first you uh, consider a uh, accepting path uh, in this uh, nfa m so it starts with q0 this nfa m and then it moves through several states and it finally reaches some states a qn which belongs to this final uh, set of final states f so that means you know that this string so this a1 a2 up to an if you take this concatenation so this string a1 up to an so this is uh, something which belongs to the language uh, uh, accepted by m so that belongs to this uh, the, so so this m accepts uh, this thing okay so that means this belongs to this thing so this happens if and only if uh, we have a path uh, like this in m okay and if we have a path uh, like this in m so then <coughs> we can uh, form a corresponding uh, derivation for this uh, a1 up to an and how does the derivation goes so <coughs> this q1 goes to a1 q1 then this q1 is replaced by a2 q2 then this q2 is replaced by a3 q3 so the next thing is a1 a2 a3 q3 and uh, after so this uh, n many steps you have this so the penultimate state is uh, uh, like this so you have up to uh, this an and this, this qn and you see that this qn belongs to f so that is why this was uh, in uh, the language of m and this qn then can go to epsilon because of uh, this thing okay so then we have generated this thing which is purely over terminals okay and uh, why do we have this uh, derivation because of uh, this production you you see that uh, so when when do you have a transition like this so if this delta say qi 
say uh, a i plus one so that goes to some q i plus one right so for a specific example this delta q one a two uh, so that contains this uh, q two and uh, that means by this uh, rule that we have constructed our grammar we have a production like this so this q1 goes to a2 q2 right so that is why we can replace this q1 here with uh, this thing and we can do that with all the steps so this goes through so we see that this particular form of um, so, so we have a grammar to uh, uh, accept uh, this uh, any any uh, regular language because if we have any regular language we can take a corresponding nfa and then for from this nfa we can construct this grammar now the converse is also true uh, that is uh, if we have a gram grammar of this form so that means uh, <coughs> uh, so now we start with this okay so take any uh, CFG uh, G uh, so this instead of VT I am using Q Sigma so right now this is just some name okay and these are so when we are looking at just this part these are not states or anything these are just uh, non terminals and these are terminals but uh, the productions are of this restricted form okay so as I said so the productions are either of this form that this non-terminal goes to a terminal followed by a non-terminal or it goes to just epsilon so if this is the form of production so then correspondingly we construct a uh, nfa m so by the same thing so earlier we had the nfa and if we had this in the nfa then uh, we constructed this production uh, for the grammar so in, in this case we have the grammar first and if we have a uh, production of this form then we are uh, I'm constructing um, uh, this uh, delta of q is so that we put p uh, inside this thing since this is a nfa we can have uh, sorry i mean in a grammar we can have uh, many such uh, things so uh, in here also we can have say uh, q going to uh, a say uh, p prime also so this can also be a production so then this p prime will also be part of this thing so whatever uh, is here so all those p's will constitute uh, this set so th this is a set right for nfa for nfa this is a set so this is how we construct and then we can how do we construct this f again by the same principle so for whichever state it goes to epsilon we put uh, that state in uh, this f so here it is not a state so it is a non terminal but here we are constructing the set of state as the set of non terminals okay and the same uh, principle goes through the, the same discussion that we had in the previous slide so the same thing goes through i won't repeat that so, uh, so again we have this so what do we see then that if we have a regular language then we can form a nfa and for that we can form a grammar of this form and if we have a grammar of this form then we can construct a nfa so that we can show that uh, the language accepted by this grammar is actually a regular uh, language so that means we are considering uh, so this uh, form of grammar so this is a cfg but the productions are of this form the non terminal goes to uh, this uh, two things uh, a terminal followed by a non terminal or a non terminal goes to epsilon so if this is the case so then this sort of grammars are called right regular grammar why right because this non terminal is sitting at the right of this uh, terminal and what we just proved is that the class of languages uh, generated by right uh, regular grammar are precisely the class of regular languages right so this is what we proved <clears throat> so similarly instead of this form uh, we can uh, dis, um, consider grammar of uh, grammar where the productions are of this form so again this part is same but instead of terminal non terminal here we have a term non terminal and terminal 
So, if the productions are of this form only, so then that grammar is called a left regular grammar and uh, the proof is almost similar. So, you can take that as an exercise. Um, so, uh, <coughs> Uh, and uh, you can again prove that uh, like we proved uh, this thing that class of uh, language is generated by uh, um, uh, right regular grammar is uh, precisely again the class of regular languages ok. So, this part you can uh, take as an exercise which is almost similar to what we did before. So, that means <coughs> It does not matter whether we are talking about uh, right regular grammar or left regular grammar. If we take uh, any uh, of this, the language generated by that uh, thing will be uh, a regular language and conversely, if we are given any regular language, we can generate a right regular or a left regular grammar for that. So, uh, grammar is called regular if it is either right regular or re left regular, right? So, that means what we are saying is that the class of the language is generated by right regular grammar, this is regular language. The class of the language is generated by left regular grammar, that is uh, regular language. So, we can just combine these two and say that the class of language is generated by regular grammar, so it's uh, regular languages. So, that is what regular uh, grammar means. So, if it is either right regular or left regular, and uh, it is kind of equivalent, right. So, uh, here we have uh, all our uh, pieces in place. So, all this uh, different kind of grammars, regular grammar, CFG, CSG and unrestricted. So, that gives us a hierarchy which is called Chomsky hierarchy and inside that also we saw that this DCFL is uh, sits between the CFL and regular language and all these inclusions are strict inclusions. Okay, so. That's the full scenario.